Okay, so my friend Donnie Deutsch, welcome back to the show. Let me go. There's so much going on, and the hour goes by quick here, mea culpa. So I just want to jump right in. The GOP tanked a border deal because Trump didn't want a Biden win so close to the election. Mm -hmm. Now, just this week, MAGA moron Mike Johnson called on Biden to take executive action at the border. So what's the catch here? What am I missing? I mean, if Biden takes executive actions, won't that equal a win for the president? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was a little flabbergasted at that also. I mean, it, I think that that's what Biden has to do. You know, the question is interesting. I, I say to myself, does the average person follow and understand that the Republicans are blocking the, the legislation that would be the toughest legislation on immigration in our lifetime? And what was interesting was in the third district congressional race with Swazi uh, running for Santos seat, he's a Democrat and he ran on immigration. He ran on that saying that the other side is killing it and he won. So maybe that message is getting through. I don't know. But Biden has to, <coughs> one way or another, I, I actually am excited about the State of the Union address and thinking maybe he will met, such, mention something. But as far as why Mikey Johnson uh, did tee that up, I don't understand it either, frankly. It, it, it makes absolutely no sense. I mean, imagine that a former president, first of all, I think that Trump should have been arrested for it. He's interfering in the national security of our country. Mm -hmm. He's interfering. It's almost like treason. If you think about it, he's almost running a shadow government within our system. He, mm -hmm. as a former president, is communicating with members of Congress even though he's not the Republican nominee as of yet, and telling them to kill a deal and not work with Democrats, not work with the president, because by doing so would equate to a win for Biden, which would hurt him in the upcoming November 2024 well, the same general thing where election. He wants the economy to tank. I mean, you know, the average person hears this and doesn't understand that this guy is just for him and he could give a fuck about the average voter uh, is astounding. You know, what? what is a, a stat that I just saw in the latest poll, one of the latest, I think it was an NBC News poll that showed me, on the issue of democracy, who's going to protect our democracy better? They're like basically tied, the 2% difference. Like how do people think that Donald Trump is not a risk to our democracy versus Joe Biden? It's just, I think that people just are just entrenched and they're tribal and they are where they are. But um, the fact that I, I don't think you could prosecute him as running a shadow government. At the end of the day, the responsibility falls on the Republicans. They don't have to listen to him. And then the next question is, why the fealty? Why the submissiveness? We know why in the Republican Party. They're all afraid of he own, Trump owns the base, and they're afraid of their next election if they cross Donald Trump of getting primaried out by somebody further to the right of them. So here's where we stand, and it's going to be up to the, the American voter in November. Except so far, Republicans have gotten shellacked in every special election, including going into 2022. Yeah. I mean, that massive red wave turned out to be, you know, a complete dud. In fact, Democrats took the bulk of the seats. Look, so Trump is, why Trump are they is, sticking with him? Trump has lost six of the last seven elections, no matter how you slice it, uh, as far as if you go back, uh, if you go back to 23, 22, 20, uh, 19, 18, 17. I mean, he's lost every election as far as whether it's losing the House, whether losing the Senate, whether it's his back candidates, whether it's his own presidential run. Why do they stick with him? I, the reason I just said, and I, I, I think at this point, if they lose, if the, if the hopefully Republicans lose, I think that will loosen the grip. I think it's. I think they need that one more head pounding, where uh, they lose, but it's just it's. It's staggering. The, the, Repub the Democrats have run every special election. The question is, will they keep that enthusiastic turnout? The, you know, I was talking to Steve Kornacki yesterday for my podcast on brand with Donnie Deutsch. Um, and he was saying that the, you know, what he's concerned about from the Democratic point of view is and what most pe pollsters are concerned about is the Democratic base is very fragile at this point. The combination of the Israeli war and what that's done to a young, young, young voters, which is part of the base. And obviously, particularly in Michigan, the Arab American voters, there are 300,000 of them, and people of color. 
uh, seems to be a vulnerable place. And those are three major constituencies of the Democratic base. So there's a lot on the table. Yeah, I mean, there are. But so here's something which is very, very interesting. If you think about it, Trump has lost despite these wins like Michigan. He received 68 percent. Right. So you're talking about 20. Well, it's actually it was uh, more like 68 percent. They say it's uh, he lost 30 percent. Yeah. And look, take, uh, of uh, the uh, republic. That's only of the Republican look, base. He, in, in South Iowa, Carolina, he lost, he lost yeah. 40 um, in South Carolina and New Hampshire. He lost 40. So you go. And on top of that, out of those 40, uh, out of this 25 percent, not out of 40, 25 percent over the overall said that they believe if he's convicted, he's not fit for office. And 25 percent have said they will not vote for him under any circumstances. So you go for a guy that seems to have a, everybody says has this MAGA grip on the party. There's a lot of a lot of lot of red alarms that should be going off for the Republicans based on that. And, you know, I don't think those voters are going to come back to Trump. I think they either sit home or they go to Biden. I mean, I think I think so as well. But the point I was making is his win yesterday in Michigan was predicated off of 756,851 votes. All right. Mm -hmm. As Joe Biden, for example, was something like 800,000 votes for him Mm -hmm. where he took 80 plus percent of Mm -hmm. the um of the Democratic uh, voters that are there. Yes. My point being that there are clearly more Democrats in the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. It is the undecideds, the uncommitteds that amounted to about 101,000 or something like that, uh, that they have to worry themselves on. But I think that the pollsters and I think that the pundits are reading this all wrong. There are in Michigan more Democrats We also have an additional nine months before the election. We already know that they're trying to figure out something in the Middle East in order to put an end to this Israel-Hamas conflict, this war. Mm -hmm. Um, That will no doubtably change, and for the better, hopefully, right, God willing. But the part that I don't understand when it comes to the Muslim community You may not like what's going on between Israel and Palestine, and I get that. But are they so forgetful that in 2017, the very first executive order that Donald Trump put out, one that was built and orchestrated by Steve Bannon and Steve Miller, was a Muslim ban in the United States? Disguised no, as an immigration. No, Michael, I, I, I don't think people think that the, uh, Arab Americans, Muslim Americans are going to go back to Trump. The concern for Democrats is they stay home. And that that's the issue that they just say, I'm not voting for you, these guys, if, particularly if things are the way they are now in Gaza. So I don't think those people are ever going back to Donald Trump. The question is, are they just disenfranchised completely? And does that cut into Biden's base? Understood. And again, yeah. I would then say to them. As Joe Biden said, what's the alternative? The alternative is a guy who will guarantee, I guarantee on the short list for AG will be this MAGA Mike Johnson Mm -hmm. who wants to change and turn America, as he said, back into a white Christian nationalistic country. First of all, we never were a white Christian nationalist country, but that's what MAGA Mike Johnson said he wants to do. Couple that with what Trump tried to pass in 2017, a Muslim ban. You stay home. You know the expression, you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get involved. You're going to stay home and be apathetic to this election. You could end up with a Trump victory, which means you're either converting to Christianity or you're leaving this country. Yeah. You know, it is a binary choice. And, you know, that... Your point is well taken. Having said that, though, if you're an Arab and you know how staunchly what an Israel supporter I am and, and how outspoken I've been on Israel's behalf, is that if the war is still going on and they have relatives that are being bombed, it's still 
not going to bring them back. You have, it's, it's a choice where they'll just go, I believe I'm not going in either direction. But your point is well taken. Yeah, well, that'd be their mistake. So yeah. going back to Moscow, Mike Johnson for a second. I mean, he's totally against aid to Ukraine. He says that we need to secure the border before we help our allies. I mean, yet, how yet, this rookie, how yet. this rookie speaker can just give Ukraine to Russia is absolutely beyond me. Well, what's incomprehensible? Who's to blame? Answer to, me this because it's a branding. But Donnie, yeah. here's a branding question for you: Who's to blame for the rebranding of Putin in America, and how do we stop it? Well, you know who's to blame. It's it's uh, your old boss, Donald Trump, uh, who has, who's uh, affectionately smitten with uh, despots, whether it's uh, Kim John or uh, or Orban. Uh, he he, these strong men titillate him for some reason. So that's who's to blame. And and you know it, he hits a nerve that nationalistic nerve, that very simplistic view of we can't help other people until we help ourselves. Completely not understanding that the NATO and the EU and that we're set up and that together we're stronger and that we give aid for selfish reasons also beyond humanistic reasons. Mm -hmm. The average person, when you, when Trump says to the average guy, Hey, look at your life sucks. And we're sending it to Israel or we're sending it to Ukraine. The, the average guy who does the average person who doesn't understand any nuance. Goes, yeah. What fuck that? And that's the nerve that Trump hits. And so Trump is obviously the one to blame for that. We know that. And that in fact, Putin is a murderer and yet, Trump will go on and and just praise him and uh, and Putin's laughing is is all the way all the way to the end. But it's not just Putin, right? The, let's talk about some of the other autocratic strongmen that he has this weird love letter affinity to, right? Kim Jong Un, a guy who you know murdered his own uncle because somebody told him that he was trying to take power. Or, you know, you have, uh, as you said, you have Orban, you have Mohammed bin Salman. I mean, the fact that he, Mohammed bin Salman was given a pass on the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, I mean, an American passport holder, again, is something that I find offensive. But you have, you know, um, I mean, how many more of these autocratic Look, wannabes is this guy going to bring? I'm not in I'm not inside Donald Trump's mind, but I think you would be better suited for this. You may even hinted at me once that something like this came out of his mouth. I think in his mind, if he could divide up the world between him, China, and Russia, and they and he stays in power forever, and the United States empire grows, and we split up the world and fuck everybody else, I, I think that would be his simple mentality. Right. Up until the point that once that existed, assuming mm -hmm. that that would happen within the next X number of years, because look, he's going to be 80 years old himself soon anyway, right? Nobody is happy with what they have. They always want more. So well, certainly him, right, have, yeah, right? Well, especially obviously. him. And by the way, no different than Xi Jinping, no different than, you know, than uh, Putin, no, you know, no different than Kim Jong-un. Okay, they'll whack up different pace, you know, pieces of the of the globe. But then ultimately, one will sure. go against the other, wanting to take that piece mm -hmm. too. It's, I mean, that sort of land grabbing shit has gone history. on throughout all of history, right? Yeah, yeah. So look, obviously, that's not a scenario anyone wants. But I, what I, what I, I'm going to ask you a question for a minute. What I still don't understand is how people do not comprehend how dangerous a next Trump presidency would be because he's smarter now. And he would figure out how to get the checks and balances out. He wouldn't surround himself with the Mattises and the Kellys. Uh, and he wouldn't, he would have the right AGs in the various states and how people truly don't understand how our democracy as we know it would be over, how he would, he would be his own justice department, would be his own military. He wouldn't have a Mark Milley in there. Uh, and all the guardrails we had wouldn't be there before. And guys like you and me would be targeted. You know, anybody who was an adversary, a political adversary of his, He'd come after, and it, it's, it's the playbook is there. It's very clear. But it's not as if, though, Donnie, you and I are making this up for the purpose of my listeners, for the purpose of being hyperbolic. These are Donald's own words. In fact, he wants to use SEAL Team 6 
to go after his political enemies. He has called for the execution of General Mark Milley and, you know, and others, uh, the president of MSNBC. I mean, these are not our words. These are us parroting what Donald Trump has said while he's on the campaign trail. You know, one of the things, Donnie, that I turned around, I said, I wrote this and I was just talking on both, you know, my TikTok as well as on uh, Instagram. Throughout Trump's presidency, he's demonstrated a disdain for constitutional norms and a desire to consolidate power in the executive branch. Again, not you and me saying it, Oh, well, authoritarians tell you what they're going to do. Uh, one thing, one thing, a, po- a positive. I can't even say a word about Donald Trump. He's transparent. He lets you know what he's going to do. There's not even a question. That's what that's what dictators do. I mean, when he turned around and said that on day one he wants to rewrite the Constitution, he wants to destroy our tripartite system of government, confer all power onto the executive branch. What is he telling you? He's telling you that. As the chief executive, all power will be conferred upon him. Here's another line that Trump has said over the course of the last three years, or I should say seven years, that the president is like a king. He's, I think, the first president in history, in United States, in the United States history, that has said that the president is the king. So, Michael, what's uh, my question to you is we we know we this is unfortunately apparent to many people, not to everybody. Democrats are, are right now, It's a, you have to say it's a toss-up. Uh, I know, you know the polls say a lot of different things, but it's a toss-up. Trump seems to be a little ahead in some of the swing states, and, and so much is going to happen between now and then. Uh, you can't even imagine. And, and But what do the Democrats do? What If you were advising the Democrats, I mean, I get asked this question all the time. You see, you know, the economy, other than inflation, is rocking, yet Biden gets terrible, terrible grades on the economy. Uh, he gets terrible grades on on dealing with the Israeli matter. He gets terrible grades on immigration, and nothing is nothing is sticking for him. And yet, it's been a very successful presidency. And of course, the big doc is he's too old. So, what do you do if you're the Democrats? What's the messaging? Okay, so let me take the first part of that. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in the polls, and I don't believe that this election is going to be the way so many are describing it, it's going to be close. Um, you know, the swing states are an issue. I, I believe that this is going to be a massive blue wave across mm-hmm. both the House, the Senate, and I believe as well as the White House. Um, your mouth to God's ears. Yeah, um, and I, I say that because we know that the biggest voting block, and again, it all is predicated on the outcome. If there's mm-hmm. another big turnout, which I expect that there will be, I think that Democrats win if there's a big turnout. Democrats Democrats win and decisively. I say this because the biggest voting bloc being Gen Z, as a result of the blunder of the overturning of Roe v. Wade, the ongoing continuous Donald Von Schitt's and Pants sticking his mint flavored gold ugly fucking sneaker right in his own mouth. All right. Saying that thanks to him, that he should be patted on the back for putting in Supreme Court judges that overturned the 50 year starry decisis on the Dobbs decision on Roe v. Wade, which has other implications, too, including the overturning of the Bivens case, Obergefell and so on. Gen Z is not going for it. Now, I'm not talking about the Bible belting you know, uh, 18-year-old, 21-year-old. I'm talking about the majority of this country, like the vast, vast majority that are watching as women's rights are being stomped on. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, now with this latest horse shit dealing with the IVF, that if you have frozen embryo and you dispose of it, you could be charged with murder along with anybody that disposes of the egg. uh, And so, Oh, on. I mean, we've gotten to a point that we are even we're even further crazy than The Handmaid's Tale, the dystopian yeah. story. Right. So I don't believe at all that Gen Z is voting 
for Donald Trump. That's 80 percent. But that's 80 percent of a massive block of voters. Mm -hmm. And who are really the Trump supporters? Who's really the bulk of the Republican Party? Yeah, you have your very loudmouth maggot morons. You have the white supremacists. You have old people that for some reason think Donald is some fucking, you know, reincarnation of Jesus, the second coming, right? We both know that he doesn't have a religious bone in his body. So I really believe that as long as Democrats, as long as Joe Biden continues to get out there, and this is what Democrats have not done, they don't let him get out there. Well, don't they're do concerned. Whatever. There can, I mean, look, that was a mistake to not have him on the Super Bowl. Uh, that was would have been a friendly place to be. It's not on Fox. And they're concerned. I mean, that's – and the American public is sensing a trepidation on their behalf. And look, both these – the, the good news for the, for the Democrats is the more Trump is out there, the better for Trump, the Democrats. And Trump has not been out there that much. So have you ever wished that you had a whiter and a brighter smile? Well, before you visit a dentist, you should know that their whitening treatments can be very expensive. And it's not just the price. You also have to book the appointment and schedule time away from work or family to sit in a dentist's office chair while undergoing the procedure. I mean, let's be honest, it's a hassle. Fortunately, now you can try Smile Actives at home or anywhere, anytime. Smile Actives offers a safe and an affordable alternative to those expensive whitening processes. Like most people, I'm a big coffee drinker. I drink a ton of coffee. And over time, I've noticed that my teeth have lost some of their brightness that I was originally used to seeing. 97% of Smile Active users in a clinical trial reported up to six shades whiter on average, all within 30 days. I'm using it. Look. I mean, simply add Smile Active Pro Whitening Gel to your regular toothpaste. It's been formulated with PolyClean technology to boost stain removal and deliver active whitening ingredients into your teeth's grooves and crannies so that you get better whitening. Smile Actives makes a teeth whitening gel that can simply be added to your toothpaste every time that you brush your teeth. So no change in your routine, no extra time, and no more messy strips, trays, or lights. People will start commenting on your whiter, your brighter smile in just days. Smile Actives is the whitening boost your favorite toothpaste needs to give you the smile that you deserve. So I want you all right now to visit smileactives.com forward slash Cohen today to receive a special buy one, get one free offer with auto delivery plus free shipping and handling. That's smileactives.com slash Cohen. Terms and conditions apply. So see the site for detail. It's going to be interesting to see both these guys because I think both their parties don't want either of their own candidates out there that much. It's kind of a sad right. state of affairs, but that's where we are. Right. But Donald ended up calling Melania the other day at CPAC Mercedes. Got mm -hmm. his own fucking wife's name. He constantly calls Nikki Haley Nancy Pelosi or he well, refers no, he's to over things. But the other thing is also the more he's out there, the more he's going to keep shooting himself in the foot. Like he said, look, oh, there's they, I only see black faces out there and, and they like me because I'm a criminal. And, 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 you know, the more he's out there, the more that fucking ridiculousness, racist tropes and other stupid things he says are going to be apparent. So, you know, my hope for the Democrats is that he's just nonstop out there 24 uh, seven. If it becomes a referendum on wit on him. Democrats win. If it comes a referendum on Biden, the Republicans win. Yeah. Well, well, well said. So look, you, then you have insurrectionist and Pennsylvania representative Scott Perry, who's out there calling on the House to disinvite President Biden from giving the State of the Union address. I mean, again, I, I don't even know how to respond. I, yeah. I, it's if it wasn't that this is so stupid, you would cry from it. They're going to disinvite the president from giving the State of the Union address. He's worried that Biden will blame Republicans for walking away from a border deal. He will. Fair he enough. Will. Fair look, enough. I think that State of the Union address is really important for Biden. I think it's a reset button. 
Uh, I thought he did a nice job on Seth Meyers the other night with our, our book yep. by our good friend, Hallie Raff. Um, I think that it's a chance to reset and it's a chance for him to look presidential uh, and strong. And uh, it's a big moment for him. I think it's March 7th, it is 6th or 7th, I'm not sure. But uh, it's a big moment for him. But going back to your branding expertise, mm -hmm. hence, of course, your podcast. Hence. What message does it send out to the voters? What what what, what message is this? What oh, message what, does it send out to the voters? Yeah, you know, on both I, sides. I, by the way, on both sides. I, I think that there's a lot of noise out there that I think voters naturally tune out. So when you have Republicans saying we're going to disinvite him to stay with the union, I think that's the noise that just doesn't land. I think the important stuff lands. As far as the message for the republic for the Democrats, what I would do. If I was in charge of them, I, I think it's it's a really a do or die situation. I would get Kelly, Mattis, McMaster, um, Millie, four generals who have served under Donald Trump to come out in the most heartfelt, direct to camera way and say, I've been there. We're going to be unsafe. He's not fit for office. And these are great American. These are Americans that, you know, are, you would say, red state, you know, meet in effect. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. you know, they're white generals of age, conservative, uh, you know, really a dire, dire warning. That would be the cornerstone of my thing in saying that we, we, we've done things a certain way for 250 years. We can't blow it up and, and everybody's life will be unsafe. Coming from, I don't know where you get more credible sources. That would be the foundation of my campaign, and then go from there. You know what always conf confuses me when you start to see all of these these trolls uh, mm -hmm. on, for example, X, right on Twitter uh, or other social media platforms, and they come hard at you, at me, at mm -hmm. folks right now that are not fitting into what they want which is only positive comments about trump even when he says things that are batshit crazy right and then you call them out on the level of stupidity on the autocratic comments on the racist the sexism misogyny xenophobia homophobia islamophobia anti-semitism it doesn't make a difference to them if you say something nasty about donald they go in right for the attack but many of them in their profile list themselves as veterans, mm -hmm. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. Oh, and we know Trump has come out and said, well, what's wrong with people that they would do the, risk their lives for their country? Why they're, they're stupid, they're suckers. You know, he, he said this and they still they still go stand behind him. And he already called for the execution of a general, a yeah. guy who has given his entire life to the protection for our democracy and service of our country, just like them. How could you possibly, if you are really military, how could you possibly stand by somebody who is demeaning and denigrating somebody who because, has achieved the absolute highest ranking in the military? In, the, in their mind, what Donald Trump has sold, Donald Trump understands that there are enough unhappy people in their own lives. And if you say to people, it's not your own fault. It's the Mexicans' fault. It's the bank's fault. It's the elite's fault. And I'm going to make things the way they were, and things will be more white again, and things will be, and technology won't be as prevalent, and we're not going to be globalists, and you'll be okay. You'll overlook a lot of other stuff because it, he is the key to your own personal resurrection. And that's the kind of core psychology that people will overlook all of these rational, cogent uh, thoughts because this is the guy that's going to make my life okay again. And it's not my fault. It's everybody else's fault. And he understands that. Yeah, I, okay, I get that for the average American. But I mm -hmm. always believed, because I know a few um, who have served in the military. And it's like, it's like, um, a, it's your fraternity. Yes. It's kind of, it's, so, it's your, part of your identity. It's part of your it's, identity. It is yeah. your identity. I'm a veteran, right? Or I'm, you know, I'm active military. It's your, it's your fraternity. The, it, Donald is not just calling 
for the expulsion of the president of the fraternity. He's calling for the execution of the highest ranking member of your fraternity. Literally, right, the general. I, I can't understand. I don't care what line of horse shit he's selling to them. It just doesn't make sense. They're not stupid people. They serve. They risk their lives. You know, and yet there they are at his rallies. Veterans for Trump proudly waving the flag. I don't get it. How do you deprogram that? I, 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 I gave it the best explanation I have. And it's a, it's a humanistic uh, kind of analysis of it. Um, I think that their explanation would be, well, he Millie was a traitor. And he, he defied our commander in chief. And this uh, people can work. We're so tribal at this point. People are so entrenched other than two or three percent of the population that they're going to work back from whatever their view, initial viewpoint is and kind of put the pieces together that way. So the answer would be if I'm a serviceman for Trump, the answer would be he's not going to take shit from any of these other dictators. He's going to let our guys loose. And Millie was a traitor. And we can't have that. And that's not what the military is all about. Turning on your commander, your direct, you know, we, I was brought up in the military to learn your direct superior. You follow orders unconditionally. Without that, the military doesn't work. So you can come up with a whole bunch of rationalizations if you're starting with, that's my guy, no matter what anybody says. Hmm. Good answer. <laughs> I mean, sad answer. So, sad so answer. But. Sad is right. Now, Tuesday, obviously, uncommitted had a surprisingly good day in Michigan because of mm -hmm. voters opposed to President Biden's handling of the war in Gaza. Mm -hmm. But the president has been clear, I mean, really crystal clear, that if Netanyahu doesn't abandon this current strategy, that he will lose America's support. Yeah. What's your, what's well, your thoughts on that? You know, it's, it's, I interviewed this morning, it hasn't aired yet, Ron Derma, who's the... Uh, sure. Uh, he's basically BB's number two. Uh, and, I, I, you know, his answer is it was very interesting because I said Tom Friedman wrote a great piece yesterday that, uh, you know, basically Israel is losing its biggest asset acceptance by its peers and friends and whatnot. And he basically said, we don't fucking care. We have to protect ourselves. You know, we, we're not running a popularity contest here. And Amer U.S. is not going anywhere. I think people see that Biden is saying that, but I don't think that there's true the words like U.S. is not going to abandon Israel. They can't. So Biden is in a very tough position. You know, Biden, on, on the one hand, I think Biden, and I think that no, nobody wants to see innocent civilians killed, but I think a lot of, I think Egypt, I think the UAE, I think Saudi Arabia, I think the United States, they're all going to say certain things. But I think on some level they want Israel to continue doing what they're doing because they have to take Hamas out. They can't, they, we can't go anywhere. It's, it's a Rubik's Cube. It's an unsolvable problem. And Biden's got a real problem here. Right, except Rubik's Cube can be solved. And it's, I've, I've seen guys solve that in, you know, as Trump would say, I could solve it in 10 seconds. Yeah, of course. I, look, I'm not a fan of Netanyahu at all. And like you, I'm not a fan of innocent civilians on any side being mm. killed. But I, I've asked this question of so many people, and not one person has been successful in the answer, because it's one of these questions that doesn't really have an answer. What is a reasonable and acceptable response to what Hamas did on October 7th? By well, answer Israel? another way. What, what would it, it, Derma was saying an interesting thing. He's not the first person who said that. If you just do population to population, if the equivalent, of, what would the United States do? There were, it would be like 50,000 people were killed, 10,000 were taken hostages, and would we be put under the same microscope? No, we would have to obliterate the enemy until we hit. By the way, if you look at um, Mosul, we took out so many more where you go kind of just, you know, analogy, percentage of civilians to the amount of bad guys that we got. It was like 5X, and nobody put the United States under that microscope. The problem you have is everybody's saying we need a two-state solution. Then you go, okay, two-state solution. Does that mean uh, Palestine gets its own military, gets its own, you know, airspace, gets its own thing, things that would truly put Israel uh, in tremendous peril? People go, well, no, we would put, you know, barriers on. But then it's not a fair two, real two-state solution. It's a, it's a, some problems don't have a crisp solution. Uh, the two-state solution doesn't work. Yet Israel staying occupying Gaza and occupying the West Bank in these current conditions doesn't work. I don't know. 
I don't know. Right. I, I mean, because there, as you said, there really is. I become a hardliner. I, be, I become a hardliner, and you know, uh, nobody wants to see innocent people killed. Innocent, the Nazis, because of the Nazis, the same way because of Hamas, innocent Germans were killed in getting rid of the Nazis. And what uh, Derm was saying, I mean, they've gotten 18 of the 14 battalions. He sees that there are about 40,000 bad guys there. Uh, they've gotten about 30 of them. There's another 10 to go. And until we get rid of, uh, until we get that, until we get the leadership, we can't start building. The question is, what does building look like after that? What does it look like? I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 there are greater minds than mine that can't figure it and out. This is I don't, you know, everybody says that there's some idealistic thing. A you, you take a you know a Palestinian leadership and some uh, some other leadership from the Arab countries and a whole new thing. But like I don't know how Hamas disappears because in certain ways it's an idea. Many people say that or Hezbollah. Where else is going to fill that vacuum? I don't. This idealized version of we build it up, it becomes the next Singapore. We tried that already. There's been billions of aid. And we see where it goes. So I don't know. I really don't know. And this is the problem that Biden is going to face yeah. here in America, November of 2024. Tremendously. And he's, look, you, it, it, he's losing, Israel is losing the hearts and minds. They, they, you know, but their attitude, he gave me a great analogy, Dermot. He said, Golda Meir said, I'd rather be written about as unpopular than written about in an obituary. I think those are close to the words, uh, the exact words. And I think that's Israel's point at this point. And uh, we'll have to see and watch. But I don't believe there's going to be a ceasefire. I, I don't see that happen because when I even I asked Dermer about that, it was like, well, you know, when we get all the hostages back, I, he, didn't, he didn't want to use the word ceasefire. He was talking about rescuing the hostages. So, so hypothetically, hypothetically in your conversation with Dermer, did you ask him, what if Hamas tomorrow gave back the 150 hostages that they've taken? Would that create a ceasefire? You I'd know, be I, curious I was, what I was a he bad would have said. He would have said, I, I think he would have danced around it. I, yeah. I don't think they want a ceasefire. I don't right. think they want to see because it. But by the way, I I, but, but by the way, I, I, I understand that. By the way, so that means... They terrorists came in and, and slaughtered the equivalent of 50,000 Americans. They took hostages and they gave the hostages back. And we go, OK, so we're back to ground zero. I, I can understand. You, know, you have to get you have to root out the cancer. And I think that they see that at this point. And look, I know I'm a hardliner at this point, but I don't I don't know what the answer is. I know I'm going to get a lot of letters from this and I don't want to see any innocent people killed. But Hamas has brought this on uh, and I don't know where we go from here. You, nobody does, including, yeah. unfortunately, our president or anyone who would be president yeah. right now. Now, yeah. Donnie, being the hardliner that you are, I know you talk a lot about anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. Somehow, somehow, and I, again, it's, it's a tough question, right? We need to separate the pro-Palestinian movement from anti-Semitism. But folks here are very yeah. black and white on this issue. Mm-hmm. So how can we do it? You know, young people, so many young people, they see things as simplistically as oppressed and oppressor. Who has the darker skin? Who has the lighter skin? Who has more money? And they see Israel as a affluent country. They see it, think of it as white people. It's, it's people of color in Israel. Um, you're, it's a very tough thing to turn around, particularly with what's with when you now go that 50% of people are young people, not 50% of all people, much higher percentage of people get their news from social media. TikTok is the biggest news outlet. TikTok is controlled by China. If the algorithms are set up for much more pro Hamas than pro Israel. So the game is stacked at this point and it's scary. And I don't know what Israel does to turn it around, particularly when they have a mindset of, we just have to protect. It's an existential crisis and fuck our popularity. So it's going to get worse. It's not going to get better as far as anti-Semitism. And it's, you know, people don't separate Israel from Jews. Uh, and by the way, neither does Hamas separate Israel from Jews. Their mission right. is to kill all Jews. And what I try and say to people, if you kind of, if you, I, I go past anti-Semitism and say, you know, if you can't get motivated by <coughs> protecting Jews, just protect its Americans because they want us the same way they want Jews. They just, they're, they're, Israel is a lower hanging fruit. 
they are jihadists. They want to destroy Western civilization. Jews are the first thing they want to go, but they want to go after a way of life. If they could take out New Jersey, they would take out New Jersey. And you got to have to frame it to people that way. And I still don't think that they're going to listen. It's truly, to me, I mean, I think I no. saw a statistic that anti-Semitism in the United States year over year is up like 2,200%. Yeah, yeah. And then right yeah. after anti-Semitism, you have... You, you have 600%, right? After October 7th, it went up 600%. Hate crimes. You would think it would be the opposite way, but no. Right. And then after anti-Semitism, you have the anti-black. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. The one thing that I can tell you, and I was speaking with Reverend Al about this, uh, you know, we were just sitting in the green room together and we were talking about it. And I had said, you know, the anti-Semitism and the racism that goes against uh, against black uh, people in, in America, they go hand in hand. And it's really one of the first times that you're seeing, you know, the two movements almost joining forces because I think that the black community realizes that after the anti-Semitism that they're next and they're like, you know, fuck this, you know, mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, we've dealt with more than enough, you know, racism mm -hmm. against us. It's things are, yeah. you know, th things are beginning to, you know, at least, you know, marginalize themselves. But now with the rise of anti-Semitism, you have the rise of racism as well. One hate, is not hate. mutually exclusive no. of the other. Hate, hate is hate. And uh, it's just, um, I'm scared, Michael. I know I, 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 on the issue of anti-Semitism and hatred of Jews, I see the way the world is stacked right now. And I see the way young people look at the world. And obviously that's our future. And I see what's being taught in universities. And I see what's, and I'm, I get worried. I get worried. You know, my youngest daughter said, my youngest daughter said to me, could there be another Holocaust? And, you know, it was only 75 years ago. It wasn't a thousand years ago. And, you know, that's what scares me about, I'm going to try and say this the right way. What scares me about a Donald Trump, and I'm not saying Donald Trump is going to create a hol Holocaust, but when the history has shown us, that when somebody gets unchecked power and someone is made up of a certain psychological fabric, anything is possible. Anything is possible against any group. That's what history has shown us. So that's why our system of democracy and checks and balances work. Because, you know, I don't think anybody saw Hitler coming in and going, he didn't run on initially, you know, I'm gonna, he didn't get elected on, I'm gonna kill all the Jews. Um, that was, that was his kind of second act, if you will. He got elected on, I'm going to protect nationalism and we're going to close the borders and, and things like that. Um, then once he's in power, anything is possible. So could history repeat itself here or anyplace else? Absolutely. And that's what scares me about a unchecked dictator in any country, whether it's here or anyplace else. Yeah, I'm more particularly worried about an unchecked dictator here in America because militarily we're so strong, right? I mean, the same as I would be concerned uh, with, you know, with China. But I mean, our technology. I'm concerned. Who's, who's to say that to, to the, your point about the Muslim ban? He doesn't turn on a certain group of people. For his, he would do. Any, he's he is the most transactional human being in the world. He would do if if you said to him, okay, do this to all those people, and it's going to keep you in power forever. He would do it in a and heartbeat. I really believe that. Yeah, no, no, in a heartbeat. You know him. And you ask, you ask anybody that knows him, and so take your what your worst imagination and say, Donald. In order for you to become the king and stay in power forever and have untold wealth and be worth hundreds of billions of dollars, you have to do these unthinkable human things. He would do them in a heartbeat. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I want to say, because we were talking about Roe v. Wade before, because you've said that overturning of Roe v. Wade will win the upcoming election for Democrats. I actually, um, I, I believe that myself. But do you think that will be true if Nikki Haley miraculously, you know, becomes the candidate? She pulls, you know, the rabbit of her ass and becomes the candidate because she herself is staunchly anti-abortion. Yeah, it'll it'll soften because, as your point earlier, Trump's been out there saying, I was responsible for overturning Roe v. Wade. I was responsible. And he's a man. And he's a misogynistic man. So it clearly, with Nikki Haley, well, I don't think she's going to be the candidate. It certainly doesn't look that way. But Nikki Haley, the message would not be, and she would also be smart enough to pivot. 
and move back and move move away from a, a short term ban and move away from the IVF nonsense. And she has already distanced herself from that. Whereas Trump is going to, as we know, what he does on everything is double and triple and quadruple down. So the message would not be as effective with Nikki Haley. I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally. So let's talk about I want to go back to, of course, you know, you you and the podcast and branding. And I want to talk about Trump and his branding. I mean, he's got his new tennis shoes, a new cologne. Well, it's not really a new cologne. It's a it, it's his old success cologne now called Victory. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's in a big, ugly fucking gold I did bottle. A, I, did a, I did a post on my Instagram about it. And I just said, I want to. I mean, I showed the bottle. And I talked about how disgusting it is in a picture of him. But I want to understand the human being that wants to smell like Donald Trump. I want to meet that person. I said, tell me that that's an appearance. By the way. You tell me he sells success books. You tell me he sells hats. You tell me he sells even sneakers. But a scent, because he's obviously a physically gross man. And you know that man, I, I've never smelled him, but you know that there is not a, a fine smelling piece of humanity. How to sell a cologne just belies all logic at all. Right? So who's buying it? I want to meet that one person that's buying Trump cologne. Well, the same, the same idiots, unfortunately, who buy, you know, gold sneakers with a massive T on it with red bottoms as if they're Christian Louboutin shoes, right? But the, the question that I that I really want to ask you, I mean, it's to me, it's just such a stupid looking sneaker. Trump says that his tarnished brand is still worth untold hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. It's what do you look think? What do well, you we think? Have, about we that? have proof. We have proof of it already. They had to take it down off of, off of buildings. It, you, you, it's it hurting the. You know. By the way, if he wants to open up a Waffle House in Tupelo, Mississippi, yes, it's a good brand. But for for any educated, affluent mind, and those are the people that he wants, and we know he he he, he courts. His brand is is toxic, it, and we we know that. And so there was a value to his brand, but he cannot stand for maybe in third world countries he can in certain countries around the world but i stand for luxury no he stands for a mass uh actually his brand is about condemnation of luxury if you think about it now what his speech is out there and everything he's about and for people who hate luxury and are jealous of luxury so the brand as he knew it is over um it's the reason it's off buildings his licensing business is over other than stupid projects like this. Um, he can cater to his audience in a very lowest common denominator way and, and sell T-shirts and hats and, like I said, waffles. But uh, as far as any luxury goods, he's out of that business. Yeah. I mean, think about what was the last real thing that he sold that made a few dollars. The Apprentice. NFTs, well, uh, his hats, right? Yeah. NF NFTs of him as like um, God. Or right. him as a, a soldier or an astronaut or a cowboy. You know, I mean, obviously very lifelike. The TBD is going to be truth social. What's that worth? You know, they, they're saying at a certain threshold, it has a $4 billion valuation. I don't think it's going to get to that threshold. So what what's it worth? And by the way, if you can't get real advertisers on something, what's it worth? Well, we see the value of what's happened to Twitter, you know, is dropped by 60 or 70%. So I don't see Truth Social as ever being a, a tremendously valuable asset. Well, so let, let me talk to you about that for a second. You have, how many people are even using Truth Social? I don't know. I don't have, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the answer million, 20 million people, right. 30 million people, something, something like that. And let's assume that that number is right. Let's assume that there's 30 million people that signed up for Truth Social. My question is, how many people are on the platform of Twitter, of X, or Facebook, right? They have billions. They right. have billions. How did they even come up with this valuation? There's no income. In fact, there was some mysterious Russian $10 million investment into Truth Social to keep it alive. Because it was Look, falling apart. The whole we all know, 
you know, we all know how we all know how valuations are made. They just pull it out of your ass, and that's the way you value something at the beginning stages of a company. And anybody that's ever takes something out, they said we're valuing at this. Anybody that has a brain will then caveat and say, but look, we don't know. You know what I mean? We got we just got to start somewhere. So the answer is they pull it out of their ass. That's where they get the valuations. Right. Well, you, right. But you can do that privately. But when you're going public, like the SPAC wants to do through a reverse merger, um, that's well, a SPAC, that's, But we know what's happened with SPAC. So, you know, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how this one plays out. Oh, yeah. I don't I don't see this as a four billion dollar venture. In fact, I don't even see it as a four hundred million dollar venture. They have no income. So what yeah. are you going to what are you deriving? Well, that's what I'm saying. You can't monetize it. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how you monetize it. Yeah. So uh, I don't get it. Yeah. Well, it, it's you know what it was. It was good for him on a front page, you know, um, news, you know, story. Saying, which is why he does everything. Yeah, which, which is, is why he does everything. Here's about yeah. Yeah. yeah, Donald Trump's you know net worth could be four billion just off of Truth Social alone. Yeah, you know, yeah. what I thought was really interesting. Oh, by the way, what do you think he's going to do? It's coming up. He's got to come up with close to a half a billion dollars. What do you think he's going to do? Uh, it's actually yeah, it's four hundred and fifty-four yeah. million. Um, I don't think he's going to be able to find that money. Um, so what's I he going to do? Has, well, I mean, he's got he has I, no choice. I mean, he, you know, he's got twenty days at this point. Yeah, I think it's like twenty-four days left. Mm-hmm. In order to file, in order to file the appeal uh, itself, you know he. No, but he's got to still come up with the. He still has to come up with the money, even if he's appealing it. Yep. Uh, listen, I know he filed the notice of appeal, which does not require the posting of the bond. But to file the uh, the appeal itself, you have to post it. I don't think he comes up with the money. I really don't. I don't know where he's going to get it from. Maybe he'll borrow it from Mohammed bin Salman. The only way he'll know? get it is is. Trumpites who want to lend them money and curry favor and, and believe that you know somehow that that money is going to turn into other money for them. I because he doesn't have you know it better than anybody. He doesn't have a half a billion dollars in cash sitting around, and no, he, he, he can't run a fire sale in in in, in two weeks. So uh, and he wouldn't sell his properties anyway because that would put that would make him look weak. So I think somehow mysterious money shows up from places that that people who will bet that he's going to be the next president of the United States and want to have him owe them. Yeah. I, I, again, I think it's very difficult for even the smart guys, unless he's going to go to a hedge fund and he's going to collateralize, you know, his entire portfolio to them in order to cover it because his entire New York portfolio, if sold after taxes, would probably cover that four hundred and fifty-four million. That's right. what I think that he would have. Whether it would be, he'd have to sell everything. And you know, people don't know this, but he has a a lot of commercial property around New York City. You know, in just the just one Central Park West, he has the Jean George restaurant. He also has a parking garage there. Parking garages, as you know, here in New York, they're worth a lot of money, especially one that's on Central Park West. Uh, I mean, it's worth real money. Uh, the, you know, he also has the parking garage at UN Plaza. You know, he's got a whole bunch of commercial space uh, over on Third Avenue and Lex but Avenue. Is that, is that stuff? Is that stuff on the water though? Well, the question becomes: Is it encumbered? Right. Right. You know, does he have mortgages on it? The answer is yeah, but there's still definitely a delta there. All of that will have to be sold, including the Seven Springs property, in order to cover all this. And that's a big gamble on his part. I'll tell you why it's a big gamble. Because he's got zero shot on this appeal. Mm-hmm. Zero to win this. Judge and Goron's 92-page decision is so well-written and it's well, is it, it, I think the appeal is, I don't think to overturn a conviction. I think the appeal would be to reduce the amount. The amount. Yeah, 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 and but that's and that's so kind of an arbitrary thing, you know. So that 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 could he certainly found guilty, and that's not changing. But the answer is okay. Should that should that you know uh, three hundred eighty been you know one hundred fifty or whatever? Just well, pulling up fifty, my ass. right? Yeah, yeah. It, it it would be irrelevant because he doesn't have that in cash either. But there's no doubt in my mind that the justification that Engoron laid in that um, decision validates the judge's decision and i don't see the appellate court overturning it under any circumstance but let me ask you this and moving on for a quick sec because republicans like mitch mcconnell and kevin mccarthy they had an opportunity to oust trump from the party 
but political cowardice stopped them from doing so. Well, now, they, they were, now wait, wait, but now Trump is burning down and dividing the party altogether. Why can't they just quit him? Look, you know that all of them, 95% of them would love to see him gone because they're, they're prisoners. The reason they don't is they're looking two years down the road. They, they want to keep their jobs. They're weak men. They're not men of principle. And, you know, they want they realize that if they go against Trump, that's his, Trump's base is who shows up in a primary. It's the 20 or 30 percent fringe and they will lose their job. And their job is their identity. It's their power base. It's their income. And it takes a person of courage like Liz Cheney to say, I don't care if I lose my job. I'm going to do the right thing. And by the way, talk about forget Republicans. How many people in general in this country, if you said, OK, you see this happening, you have to rat on your boss that he's doing this, but it's going to cost you your job. That's why whistleblowers are heroes and we don't see a lot of them. So unfortunately, it's human nature. People are weak. Yeah, I, I went to prison for it. You know, so yeah. I, I, I get the I get the entire uh, scenario. Sure. Yeah. Now, you know, Donnie, on MSNBC, you said that you're starting to feel better about the direction of the country because Trump seems weak. But do you really think that this time is different? I, you know, I go back. I have to tell you, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I have such strong convictions. I go back and forth. There are certain days. I was at the Nick game last night and some guy stopped me. Hey, Donnie, who, who's going to win the election? And I said, I really believe Biden's going to win. Did you have good seats? I, of course. You know, it's me. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm sitting on the floor with all the fancy people. Of course. But, but, um, and then other days, I don't feel as bullish. I, I think right now it's a coin toss. And I think that a lot can happen. Look, one of them could get sick. Both of them can get sick. Uh, you know, crazy things. Biden could be down 20% in the polls and he steps aside. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Uh, or tr Trump gets indicted. I mean, Trump gets convicted and certain things happen with the party. Look, it looks like these are our two guys, but anything can happen. And a lot can happen is between now and then. So I think right now it's a toss up. I think if the election was today, I think Trump would win. Uh, I say that nauseatingly. Uh, but I think it's very up in the air, and that's where we are right now. Yeah. So I don't think he would win today in a in a head to head right now today. I, I truly don't. I think what we've seen with these special elections and some of the other um, elections that have been going on, when you get to that voting booth and you have to pull that lever, I think people are really concerned. I, I agree. What, but what concerns? I, I agree with overall, and I agree that what concerns me are, are is Michigan. And it's a very tough path without Michigan. And I, I my really concerns is that, look, we see how close these elections are. And you've got 300,000 votes that are very precarious. Mm -hmm. And N Nevada looks like it's shifting back. And it's just, it becomes electoral paths. You know, I mean, it just, it, it can, can Biden win by 7 million votes again? Yes. Um, the question becomes the electoral map. And that's just, Michigan worries me a lot. It's, I, you, you, Democrats not going to win an election without winning Michigan. And they if they don't take all three of those states, they got to take Georgia and Arizona, and that gets tough. It's just, it's just, it gets tough. It gets tough. Yeah. So listen, Donnie, the hour goes by quick. My last question that I have. For yes, sir. What do you think of Biden's campaign so far? I mean, he seems to be present on social media. My opinion, not enough, but he is present on social media. And he's actually started to go after Trump. He, oh my look, he's got to go to Trump. We haven't seen it yet. You know, the campaign right. doesn't really heat up, I, I think, until May. You know, I didn't, neither campaign has started ostensibly. You know, I mean, Biden is finally going after Trump. We knew he needed to do that. His presence on social media, you know, he gets all these hits. But the messaging and the, the billion dollar messaging or two billion on each side, whatever it's going to be, has not started yet. So I, it's, it's, at this point, it's an incomplete grade. Right. But what else, like right now? Do you think that Biden should be doing, or I should really say, the DNC, Jamie Harrison, on behalf of Biden? What could they do right now the one to thing help they to could consolidate do is, the base? Is is a a dramatic executive order on immigration to take that issue and to own it, and that's why going back to one of our earlier discussions, but I don't understand why Mike Johnson is telling him to do it. Um, but some grand gesture, and I, I don't know the mechanics of it, that takes control of immigration that that that's the real other than abortion that's the that's the emotional issue that i think really triggers people yeah totally agree with you my friend donnie thank you my brother great to see you looking forward to 
seeing you not not through zoom but seeing yeah. you for a nice little Love breakfast I, actually in fact i owe you one um i will see you very soon my friend and thank you for Love you, buddy. you know and for your insight appreciate thank it. you brother